Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Um, not, not the happiest of times. I, I didn't recognize him behind his mask, but Halib, it's good to see you again. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, a particularly warm welcome to uh, Charles and, fa and your family. Um, I understand that uh, Jessica is connected and that live, st live streaming has started, so we are, we are live. Um, also, a particular warm welcome to the Vice Chancellor, um, uh, Professor Adam Abib, Vice Chancellor for the next three weeks, uh, three weeks, and the the incoming our incoming Vice Chancellor, Professor Zeblon Bulikazi, who stepped into Belinda's office um, uh, uh, and, and is now taking going to a higher a higher level. Yeah. Um, it's particularly my pleasure. I'm not going to do too much talking. In fact, I'm going to feel a little bit like a like a jack in a box uh, as I get up to to introduce people. But the the very sad news of Belinda's passing arrived. In fact, Adam Adam alerted us on Saturday as we were having uh, a, a farewell gathering for Adam, and I, I must say it sort of left a lot of us stunned. Um, we, we stumbled a little bit uh, out of that event. Um, on Sunday, um, I had a chat with Adam. Adam, of course, felt very strongly that we should have a memorial service um, and asked if I would assist. And, and of course, Charles saw that started the conversation. So firstly, I want to say how thankful I am that we've had this opportunity rather quickly for WITS to, to express its, its sense, first of all, its sense of loss, but also its uh, sense of love and respect for a, for a fallen colleague. Um, and that's really what this is today. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Adam to, to come up and, and, um, uh, and say a few words. Um, there's a long list, so I, I'm going to sort of step through this as we go along. We're going to have to sanitize these uh, speakers every time, and Michelle will do that. Uh, but I'll pop up and down as we go along. So, Adam, please, if you could come up to the podium. Thank you very much. So, Charles, uh, Jess, who's coming through on the live stream, Garrett, Matthew and Gwen. Uh, you know, I think I speak on behalf of this entire university when I uh, 
utter my condolences uh, at the loss of Belinda, I see Clarissa as well. You know, Belinda was uh, perhaps one of its greatest daughters. She was a fantastic student. Uh, she was the daughter of a vice chancellor of this place. I think it was between 1967 and 1977. She was an incredible academic and scholar. She moved on to become an executive, uh, a senior executive of this university. And in every one of those life cycles, she left an indelible mark on this university. Uh, I first heard of Belinda as a student in the humanities faculty in the sociology department in the mid-1980s. And even then, she had made already a significant mark as a scholar, as a sociologist at WITS. Uh, she was an A-rated scientist. She was recognized as such by the National Research Foundation and the country's academy. I'm not going to speak about her scholarship. I'm not going to speak about uh, the intelligible academic contribution, scholarly contribution that, that Belinda made. Uh, because I think that they are far more eminently qualified people to do so. Uh, I instead want to speak about Belinda in the last few years. When I became Vice Chancellor as of Wits University. And as, he, as many of you know, I became Vice Chancellor in one of its most tumultuous periods. Uh, and she had just left the executive of WITS and then re-emerged to serve as higher education in the form of being shadow minister of the DA and being on the portfolio committee. And when those very difficult years of fees must fall emerged, you will not believe the incredible contribution that Belinda made. I remember speaking to her repeatedly during those years and the counsel that she provided in that period. In a period where, I must say, po political posturing was rife in our system, here was a sane voice. Here was a voice that defended excellence at universities that defended the right of access, but who said that the right of access cannot destroy the quality of our institutions. Because when we destroy our institutions, we destroy the future of this country. We destroy the future of generations in that country. And so, not only did she provide important political and academic counsel in those periods uh, of fees must fall. She did so in the years thereafter. Uh, I, I hate saying this at this moment, but I think it should be said. I worry about higher education. I worry about the political posturing that happens around higher education. I am terrified about the stewardship of the system. And I am terrified that the stewardship that is meant to happen by the portfolio committee is just not there. And the one sane voice in that portfolio committee has now passed on. It's a, it's a tragedy for the family. But I want to say this, is it's a tragedy for this institution and it's a tragedy for higher education in this country. That voice will be missed in a manner 
that you have no capacity to imagine. I am terrified. We are entering into a very, very difficult period. As many of you know, our tax receipts are what? 300 billion less than what they were last year. That means that there's going to be difficult choices to be made around where money gets spent, if it gets spent in higher education, how should it be deployed, where it is deployed. And the one voice that defended access but simultaneously defended excellence of the universities will not be heard in that portfolio committee. And I am terrified of that. And so I want to say to Charles, and Gareth, and Jess, and Matthew, and Gwen, and Clarissa, uh, our condolences at this tragic time. Your loss is truly challenged. It is true that she was too young to have been lost to this country, to our university, to you as a family. But I want to say your loss is our loss. It is a deep chasm that Belinda's passing has left in your family, but in our institution, in higher education, and in this country. And I want to give you, on behalf of this university, on behalf of the generations of students that she managed, on behalf of the generation of academics and alumni who held her in high stead, on behalf of both Zeblon and I, I want to thank you for allowing Belinda to be such a great citizen of this institution. And she will be truly missed uh, by WITS, by the community, and by high education in this country. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you very much for that, Adam. Um, colleagues, um, Justice Edwin Cameron, um, for a large part of Belinda's term as the, vice, as the as Deputy Vice Chancellor, was chair of our council. Uh, a good friend, but certainly uh, Belinda and I shared this point, council meetings were intimidating to us as executives. And that's because Edwin kept us to account. Uh, but Edwin, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Thank you. family. I want to start off by saying to Eunice that I'm very sorry that I didn't know that I was intimidating you and Belinda. Never imagined that I could intimidate Belinda. The second thing I want to say off script is that Adam has spoken about political posturing. I want to add political cowardice and craveness. And Adam, you are exempted from that. My beloved colleague and friend, Dikhang Mosaneke, the Deputy Chief Justice, you were among the few prominent figures of importance in that period, particularly 2016, who called out the terror and violence and intimidation that was wreaked upon the campuses. I honor you for that courage, and I honor Dikhang for that, but I also make a link to Belinda, whom we're paying tribute to this afternoon, because it was eminently not in Belinda's blood to be craven, politically craven, PC, or to be a coward. So I'm touched and pleased and honored to be able to say a few words in honor of her, particularly in the presence of her family and loved ones. Her death earlier this week filled me with a deep sense of sadness. I must confess at once that I did not know Belinda well. We were not intimate friends, we did not visit each other's homes. Our human connection was almost entirely work-related and professional. Yet, I felt a deep and abiding respect for and connection with Belinda. When my long institutional connection with WITS started in the late 1970s, her famed father, Vice-Chancellor Professor Bazzoli had just left 
he was justly honored for his opposition to apartheid and also for his uncowardly, uncraven outspokenness. So the only Bizzoli that I ever met was Belinda. But her power as a person and her forces and intellect were enough to evoke what by reputation I knew of her father. Through the 1980s and early 1990s, she was a powerful and influential force on the campus when I was here. But our really intense association started when I became chairperson of council at the end of 1997. Belinda was a member of council, first as an elected representative of the university's professoriate. Later, in 2000, when she was appointed to the all-important post of Deputy Vice-Chancellor for research, our association became truly intense. She was appointed first as acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and I'll return to that in a moment. Let me tell you why Belinda's tenure in this post was so important. From the mid-1990s, Witz writhed painfully in a succession of leadership crises, some of which were truly agonizing. The worst was triggered when Professor Colin Bundy, after an unexpectedly short tenure, cut short his contract with Witz and left precipitately for London, catching us all by surprise. Adam, another footnote off script. You did not leave precipitately, you did not catch anyone by surprise, and your incumbency of the post that Colin Bundy left precipitately for is richly deserved, and I hope you get all honor and difficulty in it. So at this very time that we were facing this leadership crisis, the Witt student body was for the first time becoming majority black. There were two questions about all of this. The first was, would there be a white flight? Would the children of Johannesburg's middle class and affluent white families abandon the campus for the seemingly safer, whiter institutions that were elsewhere? The second question was this. Would Witz's excellence as a powerhouse of research and intellectual innovation be maintained? Both those questions were answered during Belinda's tenure as Witz's research head. The first question was answered no. Under the firm, often humorous, and principled leadership of Witz's first black vice-chancellor, Professor Louisa Nonla, whom I refer to as dearest vice-chancellor, Witz survived. It surmounted and defeated white flight. The campus student body much more closely reflected our national demography, including an appreciable and important minority of white students. The second question was answered positively. Under Professor Nonma and Belinda's keenly capable hands, Witz proudly sustained and enhanced its research output and international reputation. Loiso liked to ask me mischievously, why do people speak of maintaining academic standards now that the university is majority black and is black-led? His answer to this question was emphatic. We must not maintain, but we must improve academic standards and increase our intellectual output. Both these ideals the university achieved with the indomitable assistance and leadership and academic stature and output of Belinda Bazzoli. A fine-minded, productive researcher and writer and thinker herself, as Adam has said, Belinda engendered the same in others, and she was entitled to demand the others because of her own stature and output. Her executive role enabled her to draw up everyone around her to her standards. I have a letter which I found on my computer when I did a search yesterday afternoon that I wrote to Belinda in February 2003, and I've got a slightly mischievous reason, Charles, for reading it now. Dear Belinda, because of your stature and experience and reputation, Council decided on Friday afternoon to appoint you as DVC for research without even asking to see your CV, which members were informed was available for distribution if they wanted it. 
please let me say on behalf of all members of Council how delighted we are to have you join the Executive permanently, especially in a time that demands clarity of vision and weight of experience. Those you will bring in great measure. May you have a very fulfilling and exciting tenure. May I contrast this procedure by Council in February 2003 with a benighted meeting of the law faculty a few years later after I'd left Council. The law faculty was faced with a motion by the Dean to make me an honorary professor. Uh, I was in the Supreme Court of Appeal at that time and the Dean said, here's Justice Cameron, can we make him an honorary professor? And the Vice Chancellor said, where is his CV? So I was mischievous when I read it, but Charles, she was appointed without counsel wanting to see her CV. So enormous was her stature, and I readily accept Vice-Chancellor, dearest Vice-Chancellor, that I was not in that grade. But she was more than just a top-rate academic, and more than just an inspiration to other academics. She was also simply a joy to have on counsel. She was alert, observant, witty, often very funny. She didn't say much, but what she said had a powerful, intrusive impact. And most importantly, she was an unparalleled ally in the difficult fights that unavoidably beset its governance. It was an unmitigated pleasure to have Belinda as a colleague. She was a force of principle, truthfulness, good judgment, and sound decision-making on counsel. I left council in 2008, as I've said, and some years later, on 2014, on her retirement from WITS, she became the DA's official spokesperson on higher education, as Adam has said. What an utter gain her continued productive life was, not just for the official opposition, but for public debate and discourse in South Africa. And so with you, we mourn Belinda's passing. We mourn our loss in the energizing human capacities that she embodied. We also mourn the loss of her superb skills and stature and eloquence and waspishness as an academic and an intellectual leader in our country. And we mourn her sharp good humor and challenging subversiveness. Thank you very much for that, Edwin. Um, colleagues, there, there, there actually was technically a, a better venue than this. Um, some of the IT people said that there's another venue that had better connection. But I really thought it important that we meet in the Senate room, because it really was here where Belinda was most fierce in a defense of, of the academic project. Um, it's here when I, where I noticed Belinda, I guess we noticed each other as people willing to stand up and, and, and stand for what we thought was important in the academic values of the institution. So it's appropriate for me to ask uh, a fellow senator, uh, Christine Ray, but also a very good friend, uh, Belinda's good friend, uh, and, and family's friend, uh, to come and speak to us, address us as at honor time in Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eunice, for phoning me and inviting me to give a talk. I must say I was a bit bowled over. I thought, why is he phoning me? So I said, do you want me to speak about Belinda as a friend, because I could spend all afternoon, or, and he said, no, I want you to speak about her as a Senate member. And then you said, oh, you can do a bit of both. <laughs> so um, so I, I have put just a few things together. I'm not going to talk for a very long time. But of course, it's a great honor for me to speak uh, about Belinda today, because 
I, not, I knew her not only as the DVC of research, but she was also a great mentor for me when I became head of school of the School of Molecular and Cell Biology. And I'm not renowned for my kind of administrative skills and uh, following the rules. And so she, she, she knocked me into shape a bit. Um, and I'll always appreciate that a lot about her. But I think during those sort of mentorship years, we just became very dear friends. So I first heard Belinda speak in Senate in 1997. And I was elected as I was a young lecturer and I was elected as I was the president of the Academic Staff Association. And I was surprised because Bob Charlton always used to call me the troublemaker. I think Louisa also called me that. And, um, and so I was elected um, and I came to my very first Senate meeting and Belinda was sitting over there and Charles used to sit on the top over there. And I didn't know either of them. And um, Belinda was asked a question, and it's a long time ago, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was in the context of, of, of research. And, um, and I don't remember the exact question, but I do remember her response, which I remember was very direct, uh, very truthful, insightful, and very passionate. And I remember that the first word that came into my head was formidable. And this is the first time I had actually heard her spoke. So I turned to the Senate member who was sitting on my left, who happened to be the darling Noam Pines, and I said to him, um, who is that person who's just spoken? To which Noam replied, in his quiet, disguised, but nevertheless indignant tone, do you not know who that is? That is Professor Belinda Bazzoli, head of sociology, well-renowned author and scholar. I was suitably chastised. However, I hope I made up for this careless negligence in the years that followed. So I was very privileged to hear Belinda speak many times, both in Senate and in other public forums, on a wide range of research topics. But there was always a common theme that has been mentioned already today, and that is her absolute unwavering and passionate commitment, not just for WITS, but for all university and for all higher education institutions, to world-class competitive research and higher education excellence. And as we know, she was uh, both a leader, um, as, her, um, as recognized by the NRF as an A-rated scientist, but also an outspoken commentator on higher education through her political position at the DA. And I always used to follow her um, very closely um, when she spoke, and I always followed all, the, you know, all her articles and commentaries on the Daily Maverick and fairly other, other news um, commentaries. So I always kept in um, touch with her even when she um, uh, left campus. So I think that in terms of, of research, I got to know her best, as I said, when I was head of the School of Molecular and Cell Biology. And I was privy to her wisdom, guidance, advice, um, support and encouragement um, when we got together and created the Molecular Biosciences Trust when Louisa was still here. And then later on, we worked tirelessly together to um, create the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences with Michelle Ramsey and with Scott Hazelhurst. And in those years, um, I came to realize what a wonderful um, and highly intelligent and funny, we used to laugh a lot, person Belinda was. But even when I wasn't head of school anymore, I often needed advice. I was always getting into trouble and I, and I needed advice and I was also looking for um, expanding various other research aspects. And then I would just um, go up to the, you know, the 10th floor and I would just arrive in her office unannounced. And, and even though on the odd occasion she looked really at me rather irritatingly, but most of the time she would just sit down and give me a cup of tea and we would land up chatting about all sorts of things. I could always count on her sane, calm and thoughtful guidance and comments and inevitably all those that she gave to me turned out to be, of course, correct. So I will miss my chats with Belinda on the 10th floor, but also in Rosebank where we used to meet often for breakfast and at home. And we didn't just talk about research and wits. Um, I used to um, be very passionate about astrology. Of course, she did not believe in that at all, but she was always very tolerant of me and, and occasionally even feigned interest, but we used to laugh a lot. 
and we both had a passion for cats and of course for books and we exchanged books and some people probably don't know this but of course Belinda was a you know incredible scholar and um, I remember once I got in the car with her and she was listening to a tape of Stalin on the on the radio and I said fabulous Belinda <laughs> um, but and of course she read a lot of um, scholarly books but we had this um, passion for very good um, detective novels and um, and we used to swap books I used to go to England and buy books and we used to swap books and so that was a very special thing for me and so I would just like to say that I think we all acknowledge how what a great intellect uh, Belinda was and for me she was just a very special friend um, and Charles as well very special friend and she will be sorely missed by me Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you for that. Um, now we start with uh, perhaps a technical challenge. Uh, Belinda spent uh, much of a, the latter part of her time at WITS as, as a member of the, the WITS Institute for Social and Economic Research. And um, S Professor Sara Nuttall is online, should be online, and uh, will present an address. Can we connect with her? Yes, I'm here. Thanks so much. So I'm, I'm really very, very honored and, and very moved to talk about uh, Belinda today as we mourn her passing. Uh, and I wanted to, to extend my condolences to Charles and Jessica, Matthew and Gareth, and to say publicly, as I've written to Charles, uh, you know, how much Belinda's passing has saddened my colleagues and I at Weiser. Um, I certainly have occasion to know through intimate losses of my own something of the depth of sadness and the sense of the difficulty of death, uh, which you will almost certainly be dealing with now. Uh, and a life of almost 75 years and as multifaceted as Belinda's will most certainly take a long time to mourn um, and may well present itself in new aspects as time goes on. That I know as I send you my thoughts today. Uh, Belinda played a crucial role in the life of Wiser, and I'd like to reflect on that a little bit. And when, we sh when she was a DVC for research, during the very first years of the Institute's existence, in fact, we'll celebrate 20 years next year, she was an important and a respected voice, uh, overseeing and shepherding, I would say, the life of a growing intellectual project, which really needed defending. And this is even more important now, I think, then one can see at the time, one can see with hindsight that, that that work of shepherding and perhaps nurturing of new projects, uh, which I think WITS may not perhaps always have been as good at as it is becoming, that sense of trying to enable institutions to, to flourish and what that takes. And I think that um, Belinda was able to lend this kind of, you know, as it presents itself to me now, this, uh, this art articulated insight. Um, an institutional understanding and active support, which was based, of course, on her academic stature and her real talent for institutional leadership and her many public roles in research leadership. When WISER faced a significant and potentially fatal crisis in its capacity to continue at the end of its first decade, Belinda stepped in as acting director uh, and held the place and then the project together. She really did. Had it not been for her willingness to intervene and assume careful and considered leadership of an institute in trouble, I don't think that WISER would exist today. So I want to emphasize again how important this is as we reflect on Belinda's multi-talented and many-sided life. And to recall again her sharp intelligence her clear sense of what it takes to build institutions, her capacity to construct the kinds of coalitions that institutional life needs and must nurture to continue. I think that her commitment to higher education and to the Institute of the University, which has been so contested and so much under discussion in recent years in particular, uh, and to this university, now proudly Africa's leading higher education institution, was really very profound um, and in this sense her legacy remains strongly in this room as Eunice has said and in our many corridors in our faculty in particular today and I 
I do want to emphasize the importance, as this occasion suggests, perhaps we will, um, of listening for the echoes of her contribution and the contribution of many others. I mean, I'd like to add how generous Belinda was to me when I took over from her as director of, of Wiser in 2013. Uh, and the extent to which it was mutually understood between us in a manner she indirectly communicated that although we might not agree on everything, well, how could we? How can one admit this always contested, contentious, restless, and somewhat harsh intellectual space, it has to be said, befitting, many will say, of the roughness of a country such as ours and the challenges it throws at us, you know, weekly and monthly. That even though we may not agree, although, by the way, we quite often did agree, she was and would be broadly supportive of the process of becoming who we were to be, the process of, of, of inhabiting a South African institution worthy of its name, in other words. And I can tell you that when I heard by the grapevine that Belinda thought we were, quote, doing well, it was an accolade worth waiting for. And I want to close these very brief remarks by turning from institutional matters to the caliber of Belinda's intellectual work, since this is the stuff from which we are, you know, we are made as, as university intellectuals and the place in, in, into which we often put something of our best selves. I would say that she was never what we could call a career intellectual. She was a scholar steeped in Witz's social scientific traditions of thought and committed to its political project at the time. I admired a lot the way her institutional hat did not belie her scholarly and intellectual hat because she didn't allow it to. And that's perhaps something that I wanted to reflect on as a female intellectual to another female intellectual with respect. And in this sense, I think she resisted the encroachments of the neoliberal university and its flattening technocratic languages that I do think we need to try to pull away from today. For a young literary intellectual such as myself, Belinda's best known book, Women of Folk King, Consciousness, Life Strategy and Migrancy in South Africa, 1900 to 1983, drawing on traditions of women's studies and emerging work on oral historical narratives, was absolutely essential reading. The book, as many of you will remember, narrates the lives of 22 black South African women, all born before 1915, and all in a small town in the then Western Transvaal. And Belinda traced their lives through childhood and schooling, work in the city, marriage and family, participation in urban resistance, and finally their return to Fakeng in the 1980s. Widely known, widely recognized for its place, uh, I, I, the, the place it gives to oral histories and for its qualitative insights into the lives of women. That book remains memorable and significant today as much as Belinda's more recent work has done. So I want to say many thanks to all of you who've convened this event today and just to reflect, uh, you know, in closing again on the echoes and the importance of valuing past contributions to the making of this institution. More of all of that, to say with gratitude how much Belinda has played a role in building this institution and carrying that baton. Um, she cared very deeply about it, and I think that that notion of stewardship of an institution is one that we admire and deeply respect her for. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for that, Sarah. You remind me of that terrible day when Belinda and I had to walk across to the fifth floor of Richard Ward Building to deal with the um, leadership crisis at Wiser. Um, it was not a good day. Um, colleagues, I thought to, to ask someone to speak on Belinda's work more directly. And uh, the person who came to mind was Catherine Burns. Um, and I've asked Catherine to, to, to say a few words. Unfortunately, Catherine was really hoping to be here together with Keith. Unfortunately, she called this morning uh, sent me a message to say that she's having to self-quarantine uh, because they may have been in contact with someone who, was, who, who may have been infected. Uh, and so Catherine, I was, there was a bit of difficulty getting in contact with her, but is, is Catherine connected? Not. Are you still trying? Let's, w just alert me when, you, when she's ready and we'll call her in, okay? Uh, in that case, is, t is Professor Tandwa Mtembu connected? Tandwa? Neither. Not. Uh, no. 
Okay, so in that okay. case, I'm going to ask uh, that Loiso comes up uh, to talk. Loiso, of course, okay. was Lui Professor Loiso Nongna, who was the Vice Chancellor at the time. Uh, for much, uh, in fact, took uh, Belinda took over as yes. DVC Research. Sorry. No. Uh, uh, Belinda took over as DVC yes, Research. Yes, as I, I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Who is that? Tandwa. Is that Tandwa? That sounds like Tandwa. Tandwa, are you connected? Yes. Uh, ah, okay. I'm so sorry. Sorry, we I, I we struggling with IT. Please go ahead, Tandwa. I Tandwa, I, I, I asked Tandwa to speak really because uh, he, of course, was a fellow De Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, with Belinda. But I've also asked Tandwa to reflect on Belinda's contribution to the education sector. Tandwa has stepped out of the office as chair of uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor's Association, um, uh, Yousaf. Uh, Tandra, over to you. Thank you very much. And apologies for that mishap. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Eunice. Uh, greetings to the family. Zoli from uh, Onsland families. It is about Belinda, even though we were deputy vice chancellors uh, under the leadership of Professor Louis Nonga and. Uh, in Cameroon. It was really an exciting period uh, for me as a relatively and who to miss the Pazoli in in about uh, Tando if you can hear me I'm sorry this is a terrible connection. The higher staff member it's terrible. Yes. I don't know what to do. I've yeah. tried. Apologies, Tando. Let's try for a little later and then is we'll, we'll, we'll see if it's possible. Better now. All right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Is Catherine back? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Burns is con uh, connected. Um, are you going to have to do something to get her? we rely on these things the more they let us down <laughs> while, while that is happening let me let me just say that uh, unfortunately COVID has sort of compromised our good neighborliness uh, so we not we've been advised not to provide any food uh, and drinks a year after uh, but uh, it's, we've really been advised not to do that, especially in this time of rising COVID infection. So apologies for that. It's, it's not intended there. Even though we've never had a test to see if you can see my face or hear me. Catherine, we can see and hear you. And, uh, okay, you, thank you, you. And over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. He said they can see and hear me. He told me in my earphones. These earphones. Catherine, please go ahead. We can see and hear you clearly. Thank you. I'm so sorry for these inconveniences. A baobab tree has fallen. Belinda Bazzoli's scintillating and challenging essay Marxism, Feminism, and Southern African Studies has been read and cited across the globe and is the basis of an entire field of social theory in gender studies. It is a history of South Africa in less than 40 pages, written in imbricated chords across regional, ethnic, race, and class divisions with gender relations as its petrol and women at the wheel. 
Reading this work in the mid-1980s in South Africa, when the word women was usually seen as an insult in public life, and where one could go through an entire BA degree without reading about women as workers, or makers, or thinkers, was a lightning bolt and sparked dissertations and books into being that are being crafted to this day. The essay and the debates around it propelled young women at WITS at the time into academia, and I include myself among them. Some are still at it, and the essay is the core of our curriculum of those taught by Belinda and generations of new peers at WITS and across Southern Africa and the world. This essay threw down a gauntlet to establishment academics of all types and to many young Turks, leather-jacketed Marxists, then in full flow and with high self-regard across the social and humanities disciplines. We are still grappling with the questions she raised. Nearly 30 years ago, Belinda Bazzoli stood in front of an audience for an inaugural lecture as a full professor of sociology at WITS in this very Senate room where people are gathered today. In just over a decade at WITS, Belinda had accomplished a lot by then. She had created with colleagues a FORGE, a workshop of history and sociology and political research linked to creative and theater arts and trade union projects. In 10 years, she had launched lecture series and conferences, edited collections of groundbreaking work on South African history and social analysis, and she'd already supervised two full cohorts of PhD students whose academic careers took them across Southern Africa and the world. So there she was in 1991, already a renowned undergraduate teacher as well, who combined wit, sagacity, and passion in her pedagogy. Belinda Bazzoli's lectures that evening convened the audience around an exemplary issue at the center of her work since the completion of her PhD at Sussex in the late 70s. The social consciousness, agency, and philosophical disposition of working class women in South Africa and the implications of this for the analysis of racial capitalism in tandem with changing and reforming gender relations in a country that was then only 81 years old and therefore younger than many of her informants. Titled, The Case of Mrs. Molefe, her inaugural lecture formed part of a pioneering and unique study of 17 women, women who for some of their long lives were ambitious and conservative schoolgirls for some of their lives, wage-earning domestic workers in and around Joburg. For some of their lives, Mai Uye women, activists and courageous urban opponents of apartheid, public fighting in public against the gutting of their urban gains to defend their dignity, their relative autonomy, and their cosmopolitan selves. This book ends with her cohort living out their lives in rural, settings as matriarchs and disappointments of late 1980s South Africa. Belinda's inaugural lecture and the book it references, written through oral and archival sleuth work and assisted by Nanto Ntsoko, called Women of Pokeng, was a global standout and has been taught and cited and drawn up and in publications from Durban and Dar es Salaam to Dakar and New Delhi. At the core of her method was the honing of a sociological imagination with a fierce and independent mind, probing against cliches, probing against patronizing, simplistic and implausible analyses of suffering and also power of hope and the struggle to be freer human beings. We pay tribute today to you, to your intellect and life of scholarship and institution building, Belinda Bazzoli, historian and sociologist of global renown. 
you were a key protagonist in and builder of one of the world's greatest universities, a theorist, a teacher of thousands, a supervisor of dissertations by trade unionists, politicians, bankers, artists, nuns, teachers, musicians, civil servants, leaders of NGOs, global activists, writers, and journalists, beloved of Charles, mother of three outstanding adults, parliamentarian, defender of our constitution and the right to education, dignity and hope. A life of passion, grit, courage and great significance. Let us not forget that Belinda Bazzoli almost single-handedly saved works of art from a flooded basement at Wits and helped to build with Gertrude Posel and many others the Wits Art Museum a lover of sculpted and painted art and the majesty of our floral kingdom. Rest in peace. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much for those words. Uh, colleagues, I think you can, you can take off the, the screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to introduce him as, uh, any more than I did. Uh, Louisa, please come and address this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Program Director, Mr. VC, Professor Adam Habib, and VC Designate and all the members of the VIS community, good afternoon. Professor Charles Van Onslen and family, a special warm Molwini to you. What can I say? I can only repeat the words that I heard from my elders when I was growing up in the Eastern Cape. Words that I still hear these days on occasions like this. One of the most painful human experiences is losing a loved one. Where still is watching your loved one suffering and feeling helpless, hoping that you can share that pain. I'm reminded of this Because of the last time that Eunice and I visited Charles and Belinda, and Belinda had just started a therapy. To me, she was her bubbly, friendly, talkative, argumentative self. As we left, it was drizzling softly. Charles not only saw us to the door, he saw us to the gate. He held us together and shared with us the pain that Belinda was going through and the pain that was etched on this man's face is something that stayed with me long after that visit, Charles. Looking back on that Saturday morning, I was reminded that Belinda played many roles. She was a daughter to the predecessor of myself and Adam and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Zeblo. I didn't forget your name, sorry. <laughs> she was a life partner to Charles. She was a mother to her children. She was an aunt, she was a scholar, she was an academic and a formidable intellectual. She was a university manager and administrator and one of the leaders of our science system. She was a politician. If by some miracle, the DA had won the elections in 2019. She would have been the minister of higher education and the leader of our science system. I claim her as mine because I worked closely with Belinda for 10 years. I mention all these roles because Belinda was good at keeping them in separate compartments. I'm, remind, I'm reminded of the first time I met Charles. There was a function at Wanderers, and we happened to arrive at the same time, but in different cars. 
out of the corner of my eye, I saw that that was Belinda. But then I noticed that she was with a male companion. And I decided to slow down so that by the time we came to the door, I would check out who was with Belinda. Belinda looked at me and says, Loiso, this is Charles, my husband. And Charles, this is Loiso. And many years after that, I remember Charles and I ran into each other at a pub in Oxford. And this fascinated me. I sent her an email and said, Belinda, Charles and I were having a beer at a pub. I don't know what she took of that because she never responded. Of all the people that I worked with on the proverbial 11th floor, I worked with her the longest. As I said, a total of 10 years. In 2003, I was advised to approach her to come in as acting deputy vice chancellor research while I was filling in as vice chancellor. She was at the time the head of the School of Social Sciences, one of the biggest and most complex, should I say difficult, schools in the Faculty of Humanities. Since I had every intention to return to the position of Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, naturally I looked over her shoulder to check out what she was doing. Of course she was doing the same thing, keeping a foot as a head of School of Social Sciences. It is impossible to do justice to the significant contributions that Belinda made to the, to the VIS port research portfolio in the five minutes that I have left. Or is it still 10 minutes? Her fingerprints are prominent on various aspects of the portfolio as we currently know it. Just to remind ourselves, those that were there, that that landscape was shaped by, by VIS 2001, which was introduced about 20 years ago. When I joined this university, a few months before the rollout of this project, I was given a mandate to devolve research management to faculties, to develop a research strategy which would have focus areas, to professionalize research management in the research office which was led by Ian, and to develop a central function for postgraduate studies management. Not a single one of these was easy, and I had just started making headway when I was kicked upstairs by Edwin to the 11th floor as acting vice chancellor. As a result, everything fell on her lap. It can be decided that more power and authority should be devolved to faculty deans to manage, amongst other things, research expenditure. This made many directors of research entities furious with her. And I must say that it was very brave of Belinda to risk alienating these powerful role players within the university, people who would let, later have a say when she applied for the position of Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research. There were five to seven years of developing a coherent strategy around priority areas. Some folks, maybe especially in the humanities, describe this as marketization and commodification of knowledge on steroids. Just one or two examples that I will share with you in the time that I have. We moved from VITS receiving negative coverage in the media because our researchers were at each other's throats, especially in paleoanthropology, because one would not give access to the other to a small fragment of the molar of our distant hominid ancestors. To today, where we host a center of excellence in paleosciences, and I believe we still have a visit to the first century institute for the origins of national heritage, of life and national heritage. My contribution to this as, as deputy vice chancellor only for two years was getting the process started by declaring that there would be a single institute for human evolution. with a central collection of hominid fossils. Belinda made it all happen. Belinda was a doer. She went further than simply creating an institute for human evolution. She persuaded the poor cousins of paleoanthropology and geosciences to join in a major research activity within the university. Then she ran off to DST 
to persuade them to create a center of excellence. I don't have time to relate the full story of an occasion that I was haranguing the officials at the DST, warning them that they should stop cutting deals behind scenes and giving money to various universities. And it turned out that Belinda had been to see them just two weeks previously to cut a deal around paleo sciences. And of course, there's a story of the Vis Art Museum, one of the prominent landmarks in Bramfontein. The Vis Art collection was, as we have had, on the ba in boxes in the basement in the concourse. When we embarked, I don't know whether units remember this, we embarked on a major fundraising strategy because we had been instructed by council to do so. We decided to continue with the four uh, infrastructure developments that we're already pursuing. These were the FNB building uh, in the Faculty of Commerce Law and Management, the Chamber of Mines building in the Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, uh, the Mathematical Sciences building in the Faculty of Arts, and the School of Public Health in the Faculty of Health Sciences. One for each faculty except the Faculty of Humanities. Belinda would have none of that. We were at this said retreat on the south, and she insisted that we needed to have a project in humanities, and that project was the Vis Art Museum, which is the Vis gift to the Johannesburg community. Belinda had an expressive face, possibly her Italian genes. This was a combination of her eyes and her mouth. And in combination of these two, she would convey different messages. There was the, I can't believe you said that expression. This was usually here at Senate when she was presenting her documents, uh, and then there would be question time and somebody asks a question which displayed that they had not read the documents. Belinda would smile patiently, but her eyes and face said it all. There was a look at council. She spoke, not a lot at council, but she spoke a little bit. And this was the occasions where she felt that certain truths needed to be stated, especially raising issues that she felt that external members of council were not aware of. Belinda, this look was, there I've said it, deal with it. And then she would fold the arms, look sheepishly, waiting for the response. And my response was always, Belinda, I can't believe you said that. There was the look that led to us agreeing that we would, in fact, include the Vis Art Museum. Uh, this was the heartfall, exasperated look. Look, you guys. This was the time when she felt that she had a point, and we only needed to be persuaded to that. And the, uh, some of us would feel that, no, Belinda, we're not going that way. And you could see that Belinda was ready, should I say, to throw her toys out of out of the court, and then I had to come in and try and pacify him. Then there was the look of, I wonder if he's being serious. I think this look was reserved for me and a few other people, because she didn't get my jokes. She didn't get my Nguni jokes. And there was this occasion that we uh, hosted former president Zuma on the 11th floor for lunch. So I called her aside and said, Belinda, you are going to sit across the table from the president. Please, don't look into his eyes. Because for him, that's an invitation that uh, he should take you as a seventh wife. <laughs> Belinda looked at me and wasn't sure whether I was joking or this was serious. It's a good thing that Eunice is presiding over this occasion. I think Belinda had a soft spot for him. I think Helen Laban also had a soft spot for Eunice. I would be jealous and say it's because you guys are graduates of WITS and I only come from the University of Forte. And then I'll put them in their place and say I'm also a graduate of Oxford University. 
I liked Belinda. I enjoyed working with her. I never told her that. Today I do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luisa. That was that was really touching. Thank you. Uh, I seem to think that Tandro is is Tandro back on. No, is he on? Tandro, are you there? I hope so. Excellent. Okay. He, uh, Tandro tells us he's closer to his server now or to his connection. Tandro, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eunice. Oh. Um, I don't know why I'm getting an echo here. Oh, so. I seem to have many problems here. Yeah. Andrew, we can hear you, so go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. I think it, it's very difficult to speak after my... Uh, witty uh, former boss, uh, Professor Nona, and also uh, the illustrious speakers that have spoken before me. Um, I said earlier that I've known about the Pozzoli family since I was in the rural area of Nganja, where I grew up, and I was basically in primary school. There was a veteran um, employee who lived in Nganja. Uh, Mr. William Kwanazi, who worked in sports administration for many years. And when we were kids, he was also very close to my family, my mom and dad, when we were kids. Uh, and he would be coming from Johannesburg, he would visit them and talk so much about um, G.R. Bazoli. Uh, in fact, at some stage, I think it was um, 1974, I was in grades. He came back um, and reported uh, at our church the kind of support he had received uh, from Vets uh, through Professor Pozzoli and many others I wouldn't remember. Uh, but Pozzoli was always um, in his uh, uh, um, engagements with the family. The name Pozzoli was always there, uh, which helped to um, build some parts of the church that is still there uh, in our village. So, when I then joined VETS in 88 um, as a junior lecturer uh, in the Department of Mathematics, and uh, my office was on the second floor, and I would walk around and actually discovered that uh, there is another Pozzoli here. Um, and that was, of course, from 1974 to 1988, many, many years later. Uh, so I was excited, but even more excited in um, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2003, uh, when uh, Professor Nonga became acting Vice Chancellor and Belinda came in and became um, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, even though I didn't uh, spend many years uh, with her as a colleague, because then I left here later. I really appreciated her intellect, appreciated her resourcefulness. Um, as a younger person who was full of many uh, ideas, a lot of which could not even possibly see the light of day, I learned a lot um, about uh, putting arguments uh, forward. She was very argumentative and I will always uh, appreciate it. So, I feel that a lot has been... I'm going to talk about the Vets fabric. For 90 years to date, years 1930 to 2020 to be precise, threads have been woven into the Vets fabric. Not of, of Egyptian cotton, not of Ghanaian tent, not of Kashmir, wool. Yes, totally. the Italian silk cocoon is the source. For 47 years, years 1930 to 1977 to be precise, silk has been woven. The diverse fabric becoming silkier, giving birth the edge. With fire in the belly of the silkworm, the both totally pause. 
grows bigger and more silk is woven, keeping this to the edge. Sixty years ago, about, the IBM Model 1620 Mark I, the only computer in an African university, gives that the edge. Sixty years ago, almost, years between 1960 to 2020 to be precise, Pozzoli, the bell, joins to sustain silk weaving for when Pozzoli the Bell eventually leaves. Pozzoli the Bell of Central Block, the Bell of the 11th floor. He radiates self-confidence, intellect, knowledge, resourcefulness. Through and by the Bell of the Central Block, to and by the bell of the 11th floor, more silk, Allah the boss, is woven. The fabric becomes silkier, giving birth the edge. Many wish for the vets silky fabric. University of South Africa wishes for the bell's silk in vets in fabric. The National Research Foundation wishes for the bell's silk in vets in vets fabric. Mm -hmm. Higher education and training wish for the bells in Vettis fabric. December 5, you came, attempted to take away the bell of Central Block, the bell of our 11th floor. December 5, you came, I attempted to take away the bell silk in Vettis fabric. Attempted to take away the boss silk in Vettis fabric but it remains forever. The bars and the bell silk can be unweaved from the bell. Forever the bars of vets, forever the bell of central block, forever the bell of the 11th floor. To you, Linda, I will always salute. Thank you very much, Eunice. Thank you, Tandra. That was uh, uh, a lot better, um, and certainly um, uh, very much of a praise. No, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, it's now time for me to ask uh, Garris to address this, uh, this community. Thank you. going to have to bear with me. This might be a little tough to get through. Um, let me start by thanking um, Professor Habib and, and Witz for holding this memorial. Uh, it's a profoundly appreciated by the family and a wonderful fitting tribute to our mother. In this regard and in particular, thank you to Eunice Bellim and his team for the great care and dedication they took in putting this event together. To those who spoke so well of our mother today, thank you. She would have been so touched by both the praise and your presence. And so lastly, and by way of thanks to all of, the, to all of you who are here in person or online, thank you too. Today I'm speaking on, um, on behalf of my sister, Jessica, my brother, Matthew, and my father, Charles. Our mother loved beautiful things. She devoured books and art and music and drama. She reveled in science and technology. She marveled at architecture and engineering and medicine. She was in awe of nature and biology, of both the universe and the atom. And she immersed herself in theory and debate, in sociology and history, in politics and science and philosophy. All the beautiful things in this world and the people responsible for them animated by our mother. It did not matter what form an insight took, if it was a glorious painting, a person defying the odds, a complex microchip, a lyrical argument, or a natural wonder. 
It sparked in her an instinctive admiration and authentic curiosity to understand why it was that such a thing had come about. She loved these things for their own sake. And she loved all of it. Brahms and the Beatles, Gramsci and Peter Cook, Matisse and Gary Larson, they were all equally delightful and fascinating, as was their world view and the circumstances of their particular genius or influence. She saw this wonder everywhere, often in places no one else was looking, and in people no one else acknowledged. And she would bring to any discussion a raft of powerful insights and opinions forged by an insatiable appetite for knowledge and understanding and couched in a compassion particular to her. In this way, she was a litmus test for the quality of knowledge and debate. When surrounded by intellectual curiosity and insight, she came alive. When she would enter some arena defined by the banal or the inane, she would be downcast, genuinely saddened that people or leaders might debase language or reason, both of which she so cherished. In a society legally obsessed as it is with meaning, as prescribed absolutely in the written word, our mother lived between the lines. She was intrigued by those implicit and hidden, but more often than not determining informal forces that shape so much human behavior, by culture and psychology and by the behavior of crowds. And how she relished South Africa as an environment so rich in magic, majesty and madness on all of these fronts. She wanted to understand it all and to help others understand it. This passion was infused into her research, writing, and teaching. Fiercely intelligent, independent, and meticulous, she could make language dance just as easily as she could build a monument out of evidence, both of which augmented her influence, which was enormous and far-reaching, deep and rich. She shaped so many debates and influenced so many lives, all in the infectious manner she went about her academic, personal, and political life always learning, always teaching, one always informing the other. She was a delight to converse with because she delighted in conversing without pretense or false modesty. This impulse, a magnetic force in our mother that drew her always towards the best humankind had to offer, is not common. Many people live in intellectual isolation or appropriate ideas for partisan purposes, or simply have no interest in the world beyond their own horizons. Not our mother. She was genuinely enthused by human achievement, by the wonder <coughs> that resides in potential progress, and in the minds and societies of those unable to lock it, unlock it. As a family and as a result of her influence, we are all permanently enchanted by beautiful things. It was her and my father's gift to us. A house brimming with books, an essay discovered, a new insight or an interesting question, always with a song in the background or a series on the television. Her care and compassion held it all together. That and a wicked sense of humor so often the necessary and inevitable flip side of any intelligent desire to make sense of a world that defied reason more than embodied it. She had in her lateral streak that could floor you just as easily as it could astound you. Humor was for her just as an insightful, humor was for her as insightful a tool in the right hands as it was funny. She was our hero, and we loved her totally. It makes sense then that at the heart of our mother's life was a university, and Witz University in particular. It is true she was born into that universe, but it was also the only universe worth living in for someone of her disposition. It helped that Witz was an extension of our family and extended to all of our family. My father spent much of his life, too, in service of Witz. Jessica, Matthew, and myself are all Witz graduates. All three of us were lucky enough to be capped by our mother. 
Wits was the backdrop to so much of our lives, but it was a central pillar for my mother. It made sense too that our mother would rise to become the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, for research is the frontier of knowledge. She understood that if it was to be advanced, it would have to be staffed by the best, well funded, and promoted and defended as a necessary public good, especially in an environment often hostile to all those endeavours. In turn, that the benefit of such excellence would fall first to students themselves, and then to, society, to the society they would later shape. That was her manifesto. A.C. Grayling says that a society which resents excellence is a society in trouble. What good does it do us if we hold back the best to make the rest feel better? One doesn't have to attain excellence to get the benefits of trying to attain it, but there's no point in having anything less than the ideal, which gives the, point it's try which gives the trying its point. She did not lack for ideals, our mother. She dreamt of a South African Ivy League of research-intensive universities, evidence of the extent to which her own horizons far eclipsed the outlook of those in power, a narrow and mediocre worldview where universities are conceived of more as factories than laboratories, and outcomes measured in throughput rather than in quality. That was a belief she took to Parliament as the Shadow Minister for Higher Education, and one she fought for behind the scenes as much as she did in public, at WITS and in the Democratic Alliance. The forces for populism are stronger today than they've ever been. Always she was able to look beyond the moment, to hold the bigger picture in her mind, and never to relinquish those values and principles she held so close to her in order to appease or compromise. She understood better than many universities today that ethnic or race-based nationalism is a threat to beautiful things that nationalism values conformity and patriotism, process and moral equivalence, all euphemisms for control, not freedom, that its purpose is never to rise with the tide of human potential and mark the high point as your aspiration, but to wait rather for the low tide and forcibly anchor every boat at that depth. She was not afraid to say so, something that cannot be said for many in our universities cower before African nationalism today, while having conveniently focused so much of their energy on dismantling the injustices of an Africana nationalism. It's worth saying that she was brave in other ways too, astoundingly brave. Astoundingly brave in both her life and death, in a manner that could only ever fill you with awe and utter admiration if not disbelief, at the depth of the well from which she drew on an endless inner strength. She did that for others as much as herself. She was selfless in the most noble way. There was a profoundly powerful, ever gentle and patient, always calming and endearing love that our mother exuded. First for her family, whom she adored and worshipped. Then for her friends and colleagues, who she admired and loved. And there were so many of them, as this week has again revealed. She held them all close, and they her. It could never have been any other way if you knew our mother because she was a fundamentally good person and her warmth, kindness and charm could fill a room with no more than a smile in a way all good people can. The ideal of a university in its best sense was always precious to my mother. Rationally and emotionally it was for her a cornerstone on which any properly functioning and modern democracy should rest and a lodestar against which she made decisions and judgments, and always she tried to aspire to something better, to carry people with her and towards that ideal. And Witz was always for my mother the best chance South Africa had of obtaining that ideal. How she admired the people here, the history, the institution, the proud and the long record of excellence, 
how she worried that a decline in funding, encroachments on academic freedom and deference before, before orthodoxy were eating away relentlessly at that foundation across the board. She was a giant, our mom, the kind of person whose influence, while telling at the time, is missed most when they are gone, for then the size of the hole they've left behind is fully revealed. All universities have lost a deeply loyal, profoundly understanding, and absolutely principled soldier for their cause. Fitz University has lost on top of that one of its own. But it's the world of ideas, ultimately, that is poorest at my mom's passing. The electricity on which her enthusiasm for beautiful things ran could have powered a city. Luckily, <coughs> all the beautiful things remain and in them we'll always see a bit of her, for that really is where her spirit resides. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, before I close, if you allow me, I do want to say a few things. Uh, I, I really did like working with Belinda. Uh, I looked up to her. Uh, it's in the Senate where she taught me how to sharpen my argument. Uh, and I really did look up to that. I learned a lot from her. I, I liked the idea that we shared, which was that in the world of ideas, the contestation is not about finding out who is right and who is wrong. It's about both arguments leaving with a better understanding of itself. And, and Belinda taught me that. Uh, and I really value that, and I really thought uh, that this was uh, this was someone I your your point about her inherent goodness. Um, I miss the way she brightened up a room just when she walked in. Uh, I miss her I miss her wit, uh, that absolutely insane humour, sense of humour, um, sort of serious face she would put on in a conversation with students in a discussion and the laugh we would have thereafter because she was pretending about something or the other. People like Belinda will always die too soon. Uh, and really, that's, uh, let's accept that. Uh, it, whenever it happened, it would have been too soon. I think, the, I mean, we, we agreed on a, lot, on a lot of things. And we certainly shared intellectual and academic values. We both shrieked at the idea that the relationship between a teacher and a student could be defined in pecuniary terms. Um, it was unacceptable to us. It just rattled, it touched on a part of our soul where we didn't like to be touched, as Lois was. But we also disagreed a lot, and there was much to disagree about. Uh, I, I remember fondly Sunday, uh, Monday morning VCO meetings with Lois shouting, Eunice, Belinda, Patrick, shut up! And, and he, all he would get from us was, yes, in a minute. Um, uh, I mean, on occasion, when I was particularly being particularly frugal about uh, expenditure or something or some project, Patrick would describe me as a a lower middle class Calvinist Muslim. Go, go figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belinda would call me what her she said her mother called her father, a PBE, a poor bloody engineer. And on occasion, she would say, oh no, the PBE is at it again. Um, there were, the, the, but we, of course, worked these things out. But there was one thing that we always disagreed about. Belinda thought me an absolute Philistine, because I thought that the Beatles, m in musical terms, were a terrible group, and that their musicality was very poor. And, and occasionally, this issue would come up in, in casual conversation or somebody talk, mentioning the Beatles and I would say give my, the weight of my argument and she would counter with an equal weight of argument um, and we knew that we were never going to convince each other uh, and, and, uh, and of course uh, today I, uh, the reason I wanted to say this is because today I can say that Belinda if you're listening about the Beatles I, I was right yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I, I must say, to, 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 this brings us to the end of this, this event, but to the family uh, and to, to all of you, to Charles, to Matthew, Gareth, Gwyn, uh, and uh, Jessica who's listening in, to the extended Pizzoli family, the extended financial families. When, when the unanswerable questions come banging on our door, it's a frightening experience, as Louis always said. And, and to look into the face of these unanswerable questions is always a terrible thing. But we get, we, we gather, get together in events like these, and, and some would even say maybe we huddle together. Because in that moment of our shared humanness, our shared sense of community, the frightening face of these unanswerable questions become a little more manageable. And I really hope that while we don't know how to get uh, to, to heal the depth of your pain at your loss, I really hope that today some of the edge of that pain has come off. Um, and I really do. And I do want you to leave today with a sense that if there's any support that WITS can offer, don't hesitate to call. It's easier. Uh, whatever form it takes. So please, it's been a real pleasure having you here, and I'm really glad that we had an opportunity to share this hour in a bit. Ian, it was really nice for you, a pleasure to see you again. Uh, Peter, I haven't seen you. Friends are here. There are about 165 people on the on the internet connection. Uh, please do use the the chat facility to to send your your tributes. If not, there's a vits news at vits.ac.za website where you can send a, co a comment and we will share that with the family. So to all of you, thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here. Do go safely and be well. Thank you all.
Thank you.